Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Mary Ann Howard, and today we're going to talk about Paul Revere's Rock. This is a poem written in 1860 by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and it's about the heroic actions of an American patriot on April 18th and April 19th, 1775. So if there was a pandemic in the 1860s or the 1870s or a major snowstorm at that time, families who were stuck in their homes together would sit around the fire and read poems just like this one aloud. And so as I read you this poem, you can imagine families in East Hampton doing just that at this time period as well. Okay, so back to the poem. Now what was happening in April of 1775? This poem takes place in Massachusetts at the onset of the American Revolution. And we're in the height of tension that's mounting between the British and the American colonists over their own freedom to become an independent nation. The Boston Tea Party had already occurred, which was an act of defiance by the colonists against the British who wanted to impose taxation without representation. Paul Revere was a courier bringing information between Boston and New York on horseback. He had learned that the British were about to arrest patriots Samuel Adams and John Hancock. And so he engaged in a system of tipping off the other colonists about the movement of British troops out of Boston through signal lamps hanging in a Boston church. When Revere saw the signals, he was to ride west through Massachusetts to spread the news so they could avoid their arrest. These and other events led to the battles of Lexington and Concord, which would spark the Revolutionary War. So now, how do we know the actions of Paul Revere? I've been asking you to think about primary sources, those that are created by someone at a particular time. A primary source is an original source that documents an event in time, a person, or an idea. Some examples are original research, like a journal article, diary entries, letters, correspondence, or a photograph. In this case, we have letters that Paul Revere wrote. Circa, which means around 1798, Revere wrote a letter to his friend Jeremy Belknap, who had asked him to recount the activities of that night. And this letter is part of the Massachusetts Historical Society, and you can see it in its entirety on their website. How cool is that? So now, items of historical fiction, meaning stories that are based on a specific moment in history, often take a bit of creative leeway. Some of the parts aren't always truthful or accurate. Authors do this to move the story along, or in this case, to make a better poem. In particular, Longfellow reverses the signal lanterns hung in the church to indicate that the troops had left Boston, changes where Revere was when he saw the lanterns, and omits that Revere was arrested before he reached Concord, as well as some other detail. This poem was published in a journal in 1861, just as then President Abraham Lincoln was elected without any votes from the Confederacy. And so perhaps Longfellow wrote this poem not to specifically recount the details of Revere's ride 86 years prior, but to remind the American people of the spirit of America, not the one that fought against the tyranny of the British during the Revolutionary War, but the one that fought the powers of slavery, oppression, and tyranny leading up to the Civil War. Okay, so here we go. Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 1807 to 1882. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or by sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm, through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night and with a muffled oar silently rowed to the Charleston shore, just as the moon rose over the bay or swinging wide at her mooring play. The Somerset, a British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend through alley and street wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed to the tower of the church, up the wooden stairs with stealthy tread, to the belfry chamber overhead, 
and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade. By the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and looked down, a moment on the roofs of the town, and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath in the churchyard lay the dead, in their night encampment on the hill. Wrapped in silence, so deep and still, that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind as it went, creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride, on the opposite shore walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side. Now he gazed on the landscape far and near, then impetuous, stamped the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the Old North Church, as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still, and lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes till full on his sight, a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles and passing a spark, struck out by steed that flies fearless and fleet. That was all, and yet, through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night. And the spark struck out by that seed in his flight, kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic, meeting the ocean tides, and under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock, when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock, and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises when the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock, when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock. When he came to the bridge in Concord town, he heard the bleeding of the flock and the twitter of the birds among the trees, and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at that bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball, you know the rest in the books that you've read, how the British regulars fired and fled, and how farmers gave them ball from ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall. Chasing the red coats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again, under the trees and at the turn of the road, only pausing to fire and load. And so through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night when his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on that night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that seed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. So now, thank you again for tuning in. Join me next Wednesday, May 20th at 3.30 p.m. as I continue our programming on poetry. I'm going to be reading whimsical poems from the book, The President Stuck in the Bathtub, Poems About the President by Susan Katz, and I'll see you soon. Take care.